Let's get hype. Welcome into the Husker 24 7 hype cast as we get you fired up for what could be the sixth win of the season for Nebraska as they take on Michigan State on Saturday. And as everybody knows, six wins get you to a bowl game. And a bowl game has been the, uh, you know, the perceived destination of this season, but there could be more out there for Nebraska. And so we'll talk about that today on the Husker 24 7 Hypecast, where we have for our special guests joining the program, helping us out, making predictions. We have the color analyst for Nebraska football himself. Also, the Omaha West Side, uh, not defensive coordinator. You work with what, the, the linebackers? Is that yeah, co- de- co- it, my official title, Mike J, is co defensive coordinator. Okay, so you're the co-defensive coordinator where it's just the title, but not the actual obligation. Is that fair? Well, it's actually the obligation, and we each coach a position. So my my, my co-worker, who's the co-coordinator coach, Queen, he coaches the safeties. Everybody has a position group. But who's calling the defense? So actually, we both do. But it's you want a curveball? It's signaled in by our secondary coach. Neither one of us signal it in. How about that? All right. So it's a three-person operation to call the yeah, West Side well, defense? Yeah, there's all – yeah, I mean, basically, that's kind of how it works. Have you ever been on the sidelines of a West Side game and looked around and saw someone and wondered if they should be there or if they were a plant for another organization? I actually have. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually have. But, hey, can I so, – but can I tell you a funny story? Sure. So – Saturday, we kind of do this thing. Uh, I have to do this hit at like it typically is like one o'clock for a two thirty game, so about an hour and a half before the game. And I do it every uh, every week, and usually I can see or I talk to Coach Rule walking around the field, and he's always kind of like incognito. He has like a double size hoodie and his AirPods in, and he's like getting a workout in. And so this last time, last week, um, before Northwestern, he goes, hey, walk with me. So usually he just stops. But this time, I think he's pressed for time. So I walked with him. And we got over to that northeast corner where they come out. And he said, hey, you know, he he goes, how many people did you have when you were playing here? Probably like what, like 100? I mean, yeah, wow. I said, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Like it's, it's grown quite a bit. He goes, we, we probably, we've tripled that. We went from 100 to probably four or 500. All right. Well, let's just safely say like 150 more people for this. And I'm like, for what? And he goes, look how we have this all roped off now. We have, we got this corner. You can't go here. We got this taped off. We, we have sheriffs here. We have security here. He's like, this place was a goddamn free for all. Like, we had to we had to really tighten this thing up. And I just thought it was funny because that was like two weeks before all the Michigan stuff was like really happening. And then we get the was he really on Central Michigan sidelines? Was he was Stallions not or is it photoshopped or what? But I'm just telling you, the paranoia of people on the sidelines and it being too easy for people on the sidelines apparently was a real thing because Nebraska really tightened it up in just the last couple of two, three weeks. Anyone taking recruiting photos is very aware that the, uh, Oh, is it tough? <laughs> yeah. It's changed. It's he just laughed. Absolutely. Uh, I don't know how the security is at gateway mall anymore. I think all of their best, uh, security guards were taken by Memorial stadium. But, <laughs> wow. You know, well, well, they've definitely up we'll the personnel. See. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they do. They do. All right. So Damon Benning joins us. Husker 24-7 Hypecast. We will dive into this like we do every single week. We'll start on the offensive side of the ball. And we will start with Damon Benning. Damon, what did you think of the first game from the new look offensive line after all of the injuries Nebraska suffered against Northwestern? Did you have it was, it was weird. I think it? yeah, I think going in, I didn't really it wasn't the thing that kept me up in that. I was like, okay, Latovsky's played. Uh, Prohaska has started. And Justin Evans Jenkins was a guy that they were trying to find ways to get on the field. So I, I wasn't like – it didn't keep me up at night. And I didn't really notice it. I mean, to be honest, like if I, as I'm watching the game, this is before the rewatch, like real time, you know, I, I thought – 
Purdue's D line, especially uh, their size and some of their edge guys, like they had some fellas. And I, I felt like that was always going to be a thing. I knew they weren't very good on the back end, but their they're big guys up front were going to present some problems. And I mean, I, I, I didn't really notice. I thought, and I think that's a good thing, right? Like if I'm not saying to myself, well, he wasn't very good or he wasn't very good or this was, yeah, I, you know, I think it was fine. I, I didn't mind uh, the offensive line at all. And I think they're only going to get better, to be honest. BC, the second straight game, Nebraska's hit on the belly option pass play. Can this be a thing that they can catch teams on every week, or is it going to quickly, you know, after you've done it these last two weeks, do you think teams are going to be pretty prepared for that moving forward in the month of November? Because that's largely been Nebraska's only downfield passing offense. Like, there are two big plays two weeks off of it, but it's been hard for them to move the ball downfield without it. Well, I think there'll be obviously more awareness of it now that's on film and the the big splashes those plays have uh, have have caused. Um, but still, I, I, it's it can still work within a game where you get into the second quarter or so and you're kind of pounding on a team and a guy loses his focus for you know two seconds and the guy's five yards behind him. So I think there's always a place for it. You know, once or twice a game uh, where it can have an impact. They knew they wanted to call that play and they wanted to call it early uh, from everything we've heard. And I think they expected it to be a, a success. So it's one of those plays. It, it was used so um, efficiently um, when, when Damon was a player. You just sort of uh, always expected it to kind of work. It's just like a great gotcha play. So I love when it gets called. You just probably can't overuse it. But it's really good for these young receivers to have those moments, you know, where Jalen um, you know, he, he makes that play that kind of turns the game and Malachi made one the week before, and it just builds confidence. And I thought Jaden Doss, it's not connected to that play, but that third down catch he had, um, was huge yeah. in that game at that moment. We're talking about it was zero, zero. And that was the driver. They got all the third downs. And that's the type of play, even though it wasn't a touchdown that I think can get him going a little bit too. Brunts, we saw four more fumbles for Nebraska on Saturday. Uh, Ball security has been a big issue for this team all season long. Is there even any reason to think that they can sort of reverse that trend as we go into the month of November? Or do you just kind of expect this is a team where a couple turnovers a game just sort of feels like what they are? Yeah, it it feels like something that should be reversible, but it's, it's just in the walls. Like, you know, the, the fumbles that Harburg had, I mean, Matt, Matt Rule kind of mentioned it. They came when the, he, he was basically giving himself up. I mean, the play was over. You just got to get down. Um, you know, with with the backs, I mean, it's it's kind of the similar issues. I mean, they're coaching the the, the high and tight and the it was four, four or five points of contact and everything else. And uh, for whatever reason, when, when they get out there, it's just not happening. So... I don't know. I mean, you would hope that those those things would kind of work themselves out as the season goes along, but you almost kind of have to just expect them. You know, it's like you you, you go and you take a flight somewhere and kind of expect a little bit of a delay no matter what you're doing. And, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's okay, I think, as long as the defense continues to, you know, take the ball away the way they have the last couple of games. But, at some point, those mistakes are going to catch up to you as an offense. I mean, the, the margin of error is so thin that, you know, in some ways, Nebraska is very fortunate that they haven't been uh, hurt over the last three games by some of the the, the turnovers they have and, and a lot of them that have seemed really avoidable and, and somewhat predictable, too. Yeah. Damon, Emmett Johnson, 149 yards, 25 carries the last two weeks combined. What have you seen uh, from him as he's gotten this opportunity? And is this the sort of thing where he could kind of put a stamp on on his ability to play for 2024 and beyond if he's able to finish out with a good month of November? Yeah, I think that's definitely part of it, right? He's still going to grow. Like, he's very slight. And I don't think he's a – He's a 15 to 20 carry guy yet, but he doesn't have to be yet, right? I, I kind of like the way you phrased the question. He continues to grow and kind of evolve, and he's very decisive. He's a good downhill runner. Like, he puts his foot in the dirt, and, and he expects to come out of the back end. And you don't sometimes see that from, from young guys. So I really like that about it. And I think as he continues to grow physically and mature in the weight room, he's showing you enough 
at least in these early stages, that are going to give himself a chance to be in the discussion. Because I knew they liked him in, in camp, spring, fall, and they were going to try to work him in on special teams, you know, because they thought he was fairly dynamic with the ball under his arms, and it just didn't really come to fruition for a multitude of reasons. But, I mean, shoot, you guys, like, he's got some talent. And, and I like the fact that he – so my two favorite things about him is – once he sees the crease, he gets in it, and he's he, he's very – what I call – I always say like skinny in the hole. He doesn't take a lot of good, solid shots. He's constantly falling forward with like little subtle sh shoulder turns and slight turns. He's I, – I, like I like what he's brought to the table so far. BC, when you look at Nebraska's situation now at punt return, yeah. you lose – Billy Camp. It wasn't good before, but it felt like after Alex Bullock muffed the initial punt return that Nebraska was fortunate to get the ball back, he lacked the confidence to even go up and try to catch the ball on some of those uh, punts as well. What did we What did we sort of learn from Ed Foley this week about uh, Nebraska's punt return situation? What other options exist there? And is it a thing where they could have an actual weapon on a return? Or do you think right now it's just all about securing the ball and trying to, to keep as much field position as you can. I think it's mostly about securing the ball the rest of this season. Yeah. Um, that, that's got to be the first and foremost thing. You just can't have that play where you give the ball up at the 15-yard line. It, everybody on this panel is a fan of Alex Bullock, um, mm -hmm. I think. And just like what he did at Creighton Prep, and I think there, a couple of us thought he, he was going to make a difference at some point. And he's played almost, if you take out the offensive line guys, he's played more snaps than about anybody on the offense. And so he has been a guy who has meant a lot to this team. But I can imagine once you have one ball that you don't secure back there as a return man, that's a that's a tough mental thing to deal with. So it's got it's going to um, he's going to have to have some fortitude to get past that. Ethan Nation could be an option. They liked him in the offseason. He was brought up at the press conference the other day. Now, the thing with Ethan is he's played three games. Mm -hmm. And so you would have to make a decision there. If you would want to, uh, if it's that much worth to you to blow his through his red shirt and, and have him do that role through November. So I don't know if that's going to be a factor or not. Obviously, they could get Billy Kemp back too. But Ed fully pointed out they haven't had a return of more than, I think, 10 yards. Yeah. No, nah, they had, they have had one maybe, but, but I mean, more or less, it, it's, it's all just like it's Panico stuff right now. And, and, and Panico stuff, I think, is okay actually for the rest of this year. So, my short answer after I said all that is secure the ball first and foremost, find the guy who's the most reliable to catch it. I think Alex can do it, but it's just a matter of kind of getting the, the that that vibe out of your head after you had a, a bad experience. And it is tricky to catch the ball in Memorial Stadium. That wind is is legit difficult to deal with <laughs> there. Brunt, everybody loves to talk about uh, what's coming next, and so we will do the same here. Transfer portal, I'm removing the quarterback. What offensive position do you think it's most imperative for Nebraska to go in and get someone from the transfer portal for the 2024 season, knowing what you know about what they have on offense and what you would expect to return for next year? Yeah, I mean, I think you got to go get a running back. Um, you know, you you lost Kwan Lacey as a commit this month, which hurts. Um, you, you had pretty major injuries to um, Gabe Irvin, um, Ramir Johnson's kind of you know, may, might be coming back after the, the shoulder issue. Um, you lose Anthony Grant. I mean, I, I think you got to find somebody at that position that's a little bit more proven. And I think that's a spot where you can. I mean, I everybody's going to point to offensive line. And I think, you know, you have to kind of look for help there. But that's that to me is kind of like a premium portal um, position right now is finding offensive line help. So I, I think a running back, I mean, I don't know that you need Kenneth Walker, but you need somebody – <laughs> that can come in and, and be an every down back. I mean, I, I think that's kind of where you're at right now as a program. And, and maybe you find somebody late that, that fits what you're looking for uh, in this recruiting class, but it's, it's thin. Um, and, and you're going to have question marks on, around guys that are coming back too. So I, I would probably go there. I mean, you're probably going to need to find a veteran wide receiver too. I mean, it, it, it's going to be fascinating to see how all this math works out with the scholarship stuff. Um, in, in the 85, we always say, well, it, it always works itself out. Um, it does. It does. It's some come hell or high water. They're going to be at 85. 
Um, there's going to be a lot of three card money though, to making, making sure that everything works. And, but I, I think you got to go in and get a running back out of the portal. I can, I can already imagine an off season, uh, you know, series from BC, the drive for 85, where he's just going through the roster and trying to figure out what iteration of 85 players will be on scholarship. <laughs> I, I, I can imagine it and everything. I, I feel like I know. What dr- drive for 85. That's yeah. a t-shirt. Yeah. It's a playoff of his drive for six. He used to do. Yeah. The scholarship charts kind of been blown up though. You know, there's always the 85, everybody posts and where they're at and stuff. So people don't even know who's on it necessarily now with yeah. like, you know, who, who got moved over and getting an NIL money and all that stuff. So it's going to be kind of tricky to monitor. All right. Well, we'll keep an eye out for drive for 85 starting in December. All right. Uh, moving over to defense. I want to start with a conversation that I had with Damon in the press box at Minnesota where he expressed concern because Jamari Butler was not going to be available that day. I feel like Jamari Butler came on in the month of October and kind of broke out, even if there's not like a ton of stats behind him. It just felt like every time you looked up, he was getting pressure when he was in on a pass rush. He was in on some key plays. Like I just, I feel like we've witnessed a, a breakout month from Jamari Butler and there's a lot more that's still to come. Damon, what did you like about him coming into the season? What have you seen from him so far this year? Yeah, he's something else. It's, number one, it starts with his approach. Like, um, he looks the part, no question, but he's not a fake tough guy. Like, uh, so a lot of people have those guys, oh, you know, have him get off the bus first, right? Well, Jamari's going to he's gonna answer the dinner bell too, right? So I like that because he's highly, highly competitive. And when Coach Rule said, and he kind of glossed over it, because he says so much in a little bit of time. But remember, he said Jamari was the guy where he said, hey, you know, if, if Jamari was healthy, he probably would have been the starter. The names are listed in alphabetical order. Like he kind of went into that little deal about don't make so much about the Jack position um, early in the season. And so that further kind of let me know that he liked where Butler was was moving. And he said, and Coach Rule said something about three weeks ago, you guys. He said, you know, some of these guys, just their buying has been unbelievable. He said, you know, we can move a guy and we can play him 10 or 12 plays here and buy us some time to get them on the field until they move back to where they're going to be. So we try to tell those guys, don't look at it as a demotion. Look at it as a way to stay ahead of the game for when you ultimately land where you're going to be. And so that kind of – it's just one of those other things that you put in the match with the belt and you go, you know what, like there's definitely a plan to this. And so for Butler, he's super twitchy. He's way strong. He's ultra competitive. I think – he. so you guys can, can fact find on this. I'm not sure. Butler strikes me as the type – you know how every coach has those guys that like report back to them? Like Butler strikes me as the guy that – Coaches would talk to to get a pulse of what everybody else is doing, right? Like, not I don't, I don't mean like you know, a snitch or like an informant, or, not an informant, <laughs> but like Butler has a good pulse of what's going on. I and he's very mature. Um, I don't know, he, he I, I like the fact that he works and he, he'll do whatever he can do to play. Like, that's all I care about. Like, you're going to win with guys like that. More guys that you have like that, the better it is. So when he wasn't playing against Minnesota, well, there's a number of reasons I was concerned about that. None of them really came to fruition uh, because they played fine defensively. But um, I like his leadership. And and when you put it like his physical prowess, because, I mean, you guys see him up close. Like, he's a dude. And and he can stand up and play in a two-point. And he can put his hand in the dirt. He's he's a really, really good player. Really good player. All right. BC, I uh, I wrote in the stock market report for today. I have Tommy Hill trending up. It feels like we're getting <laughs> the best version of him that we've seen so far. And it's not even the interceptions or the takeaways. I thought his pass defense on that two-point conversion was really good. Yeah. It feels like he has a better feel for what he's being asked to do and a little bit more confidence playing on the island when we've seen him out there as a, as a defensive back. What, where, where are you at with Tommy Hill and kind of how does the secondary change if he's able to, to step in and, and be 
a full corner for you as you're dealing with Omar Brown and, and the injury there. We could connect this a little bit back to Jamari. Tommy was one of those guys who you're always like, he's, he's that close. Like you see it, he's on the fringe, you know, of, of being something. And uh, the last couple weeks, it feels like that's happened. And there's a confidence that comes from actually doing it. Tony white talks about that all the time. Guys think they can do it, but then you actually do it. And it's just, it becomes an expectation after that. And so I'm really excited to see if he can um, sort of use that as a launching pad, what happened Saturday with a couple of the picks. Um, I also like the fact that I, I thought he made a great play on the deep ball that hung up in the wind that was picked off. But um, when that ball was first let go, I think Rule thought it too, because he kind of mentioned in Monday when they looked at the tape, there were some Purdue guys that got behind him on a couple of plays. Yeah. And maybe uh, the elements helped you out there. But I like that this staff is just like that Sunday tape is has such honesty, I think, to this team and this defense accepts it like they do. So I think guys, even guys like Tommy, who made plays in that game, can look at certain things and say it worked that week. But will it work going forward this week? What happened there? Are there holes that we still need to cover uh, that were there to be had? And um, I think they've got a maturity on that side of the ball that has really benefited them in, in taking that teaching and and it, you know, being truthful about even the good stuff and seeing how it could have been bad stuff. Brent, I want to give you this opportunity to talk about Ty Robinson. He led the team, I believe, in snaps uh, last week or certainly led the defensive line in snaps last week. It feels like he's had a good season, though we spend a lot of our time talking about Nash, talking about Jamari, talking about the linebackers, talking about the secondary. Ty Robinson's kind of been a really consistent focal point in all of this for the coaching staff. What have you seen from him this year. Yeah, I asked Tony White about that last week because it's the you're right, the the numbers would would not, you know, show a guy that's been really impactful on the defensive line, but I think a lot of those guys who you just mentioned are benefiting a lot from Ty Robinson and what he's doing um on, on that defensive line. And I, I mean, you go back and watch that Purdue game, a lot of times when Card was getting flushed, the pressure was coming up the middle or um, you know, Robinson was was doing a good job of forcing the issue there. Um, you know, he, he's had a really strong season. Um, I'll, I'll be eager to see what he decides. He's, he's talked about what his decision is and, and the fact that there is one coming up for him at the end of the season. Uh, but he, I think he's had the kind of year that, you know, NFL teams are going to look at and see the impact that he made. And, you know, I'll be curious to see if he comes back. But, you know, with as much as, you know, we talk about Huttmacher's, you know, kind of arrival this season and, and the impactful plays that he's made. I mean, Ty Robinson has been just as important to that defense and the work they've done uh, with the front seven. So um, we'll see if he can kind of finish off some of those sacks over the last four games. But uh, he, the, the defense has played really loud this year um, as a group. And I think Ty Robinson, you know, has had a quiet year, but a really, really good one. To uh, speed this up, I'm just going to go to one more question here defensively. I'm going to throw it at Damon because I think it's an interesting topic. Take some time with it if he wants. How, you've you've coached football. You've been around a lot of football. You uh, covered, obviously, this year's team, last year's team, and you were on the broadcast for last year as well. How did Nebraska flip its tackling woes in one offseason? Because if you just go look at that Purdue game in just the first quarter alone and watch John Bullock, come down from his spot several times like just completely clean finishes the play and that's just one guy in one moment but we've seen that all year the tackling has been so much better how did this go from an area that had been a concern for several years for Nebraska uh, to, to what feels like a real strength up and down the entire defensive roster it's not just like two guys it's pretty much everybody flowing to the ball and when they get there they wrap up and hold and the you know the other guys come or they finish them off. What have you yeah, seen? How do they do that? that? That's a great call. It, it, and it's, I, I like the fact that you said it's uh it's not a singular thing too. It's everybody. And it's exactly how they practice. There were some times and I'll just, I'll be honest, right? I, like, Oh, you know, the nineties guy is supposed to be super tough. Well, there were some times I would watch these guys practice and I was like, they're going to get somebody hurt. <laughs> right? Like they're doing too much. Where, well, just take 
just take half your Michigan and you come back and you practice on a Sunday and you're in full pads. Like theoretically, that's not really how the body is designed to go, right? Like you need some downtime, you need some recovery. You know, studies show there's this thing about impact and, you know, blood flow and how it pools and eh, no, we didn't like the way we played. So we're going to be physical the very next day and we're going to embrace it. It's exactly how they practice. Even when their numbers are thin in some spots, they don't hold back. Like they take guys to the ground. They Henrik Harburg does not take those shots that he's taken without him getting hit in practice before. Those are not new to his body. Now he has now he took some thumps. Uh Northwestern got him good and Purdue got him good. He doesn't necessarily take those in practice, but they brought him to the ground. They brought Jeff Sims to the ground. They go through the tackling gauntlet. And they're so precise. I watched the drill. This was probably a month, month and a half ago. I actually stole the I, I, I stole the drill for our high school, but they were doing like this angle tackle thing and they wanted top shoulder leverage. So if you were on the top shoulder, you were the guy that was could come after the ball because you were anticipating that it was going to be secured by the first initial tackler. And they did it over and over again. And they were so precise about, hey, do it again. Top shoulder. Hey, free hand on the ball. Hey, corral. Make sure you you secure. Grab skin. Like all these little nuances to tackling. And they did it over and over and over again. And I'll tell you, the moment I, I think, because I've kind of been tough on T. Hill at least internally, like not outwardly have I been like, oh, gosh. I just – there were some things last year in the kick return game, and he rolled the ball out of the end zone, and he's kind of disgruntled in Iowa City. And I always thought he was kind of showing up as teammates, so it, it, it rubbed me the wrong way. But I knew that they were high on him, so he's a guy that I watched all the time. And there was an instance in fall camp where they were doing a similar drill to the one I was talking about. And to the naked eye, it looked like T. Hill was he was he was going with Bullock. So Bullock was securing, and and Tommy was coming in, and it looked it looked about like everybody else's. And and Coach Rule said, "Hey, don't give me any of that that half arm stuff. Get all the way in there and commit." And it seemed like he was kind of just messing with him because it, it seemed really nitpicky. Tommy Hill like tapped his cap and he did a thumbs up to him and he shook his head and went back to the end of the line to get another rep. And I was thinking a couple things there. Number one, he received ultra finite critical instruction. He received it. Well, zero feedback got back in line and they did it again. Like that, that's how they practice when they talk about vice tackling or, or to watch Dvorak come back to the group after a live play and those guys aren't even in and he says okay hey tackle pulled where do we fit that what shoulder are we using and the guys have to regurgitate it back to them like you can just tell they rep the heck out of it they are so well trained like you my level of appreciation for getting 30 guys to be able to do something like everybody else is unbelievable like, we kind of just are like, oh, God, they're playing the 26th guy. Like, man, that's hard because coaches really only play guys they trust. So to trust that many guys when you've been that porous is – it's nothing short of fantastic. But I'm telling you, it's because they rep it. Like, they play exactly how they practice. If there's a, if there's a random ball bouncing around on the turf or the grass, hey, get ball, get ball. Or it's just – it's become muscle memory the way that they play. I'm serious. All right. Good stuff there. We're going to take a quick time out. We're going to come back. We'll get into oddly specific predictions, picks to click, and the game prediction for the game ahead, Nebraska at Michigan State on Saturday. Oddly specific prediction time. Uh, Damon, I'm sure you're familiar with this part of the uh, the, the programming. Everyone makes a, a prediction for something they expect to happen or they think will happen on Saturday. And sometimes we come really, really close, but the caveat is it's got to be pretty specific. It can't just be oh, geez. a touchdown. We need to know what the down and distance potentially was 
okay. uh, maybe what quarter, if you want to throw a time on it. Um, but we'll okay. give you a little bit of time to think about it, and we'll start with Brian Christopoulos. Okay, got one. <laughs> All right. Um, Avano's going to hit another 50-plus yarder, 51 yards um, in the second quarter uh, near the end of the half. Um, so he's going to keep rolling. Also, um, I'll throw one more in. Uh, Timon Lynham is, My going dude. Ca- is going to cause a fumble or get on a fumble on an attempted Michigan State punt return. Um, he's been fantastic the last two weeks um, on one-on-one dynamic plays on, on punt coverage. And this this week, uh, he's involved in a turnover. All right. Michael Brunt. Yeah, I think I think the trend of freshmen catching touchdowns continues. Yeah, there goes my uh, <laughs> specific prediction. I think we're going to see Jaden Doss catch a touchdown. I don't think it's going to be nearly as long as the other two. I think it's going to be more of the the Billy Kemp type route that you would see. Maybe a, I don't know, let's say six yards, but it's not going to be a traditional pass. It's going to be the one where. It comes in motion. They they kind of throw it up. He catches it. It counts as a pass. Uh, six yards, though. Nebraska's made an absolute uh, circus out of some of the red zone offense stuff. But Jaden Doss goes in from six yards out and uh, completes the freshman wide receiver touchdown hat trick. So six yards, Jaden Doss uh, with the little kind of toss handoff thing. All right. I am going to go uh, with my backup oddly specific prediction, which I just created two seconds ago. Sorry. And uh, no, you're good. You're good. Tommy Hill will go a fourth straight game with a takeaway, but this time he will turn the defense into offense. We saw he might have had an opportunity to do it on Saturday, but he took the knee. Uh, it looked like against Illinois, he wanted the opportunity to do it, um, but he just was not able to reverse the field all the way to the the far boundary and then get into score. But on Saturday, on an interception at midfield, he will catch the ball at exactly the 50-yard line. He will then just race up the sidelines untouched for a touchdown for Nebraska in the second quarter on Saturday. Second quarter, Tommy Hill, 50-yard interception return for a touchdown. Just put it in the bank now. Damon, all right. You got three I examples. Almost, Where are you going? Uh, yeah, well, I, this one I thought this one was easy, and it's going to be the second score of the game. It's off a deflection, and it's going to be a pick six. And funny thing enough, it's the off my line. Malcolm Hartsaw. He he's going to get his hands on a ball off a deflection and score to put Nebraska up two scores. It will be the second score of the game, but the first one for the defense. And it's going to be hard. So I'm going to on a deflection or tip pick six, if you will. Who, who do you, do you want to really go for the trifecta? You got the touchdown. You gave us the quarter. Actually, this would be a quad. Uh, who tipped the ball? Yeah. Who's who's tipped on it? Oh, so, oh, that's a good one. You know, it's going to be, it's, it's, it's going to be Cam Leonard. Okay. Cam Leonard's going to get gonna it, it, a ball it, it, in the air. Malcolm in the air. Interception. Yeah. 100%. For touchdown. Second write score, it. second quarter. You got very specific. I'm very proud of you. Right, write it down. They're gonna throw that little quick look in that they like to do, and he's gonna get his hands up, and it's gonna be all she wrote. And that's okay. simply right. because I don't think Hauser can play dead. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, pick the click, pick the click for Saturday. BC, who you got? Uh, how about a a Javen a Buddha right um, making a, a a big time play kind of like what Damon is speaking of at some point in this game. I, uh, he was up front the other day. Um, I think he's really encouraged about how his season has gone after, you know, fighting through some injuries earlier in his career and a lot of stuff. And here he is, and he's playing a lot. And, um, Javen Buda, right. Ha- uh, makes a couple impact plays that, uh, help Nebraska get over the top. Brunt. I was just checking my handy dandy and unimpeachable Apple weather app here. Ooh. And then, <laughs> For the next 10 days in East Lansing, Michigan, it's going to be cloudy. That's it. There's no sun. It's going to be Big Ten football at its finest. And I think Brian Buschini is going to have a big day. He's kicking on grass. He's going to be he's going to be back up the ledges. He's going to be kicking them inside the 20. Uh, I think Buschini is going to have a big day. Uh, Nebraska is going to win the field position battle, and a large, a large part of that is going to be the uh, punting of Brian Buschini up into the – 
very steel gray skies in East Lansing, Michigan. I'm not sure which one of you talked to him this week, but he had a great quote about just the wind in Memorial Stadium and getting used to that and 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 everything else. So uh, best of luck to Brian Buscini there at uh, Spartan Stadium. All right, I was going to go with Tommy Hill as my pick to click, but I obviously made that my oddly specific prediction, so I'm just reversing it. Jaden Doss will lead all of Nebraska's uh, pass catchers in yardage on Saturday. Damon, who you got? Uh, I'm going with John Bullock. Uh, it's a it's a ten tackle game. They'll have six assists, uh, four solos. Uh, it's just who he is. It's kind of how Michigan State's offense plays. And listen, they may you talk about oddly specific. This is the type of game where they may have to go to like instant replay on a targeting call for Bullock. I I think this is this this game is tailor made for the way that he likes to play. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and do game prediction. We'll just start with you right away, Damon. What is your uh, your score prediction for Saturday? Uh, that is so tough. It's going to be low scoring. It's going to be ugly. I'm going to go. Oh, let's go 22-13 Nebraska. All right. Nine-point win for the Huskers. BC, what do you got? Um, I'll say uh, Nebraska 20 to 16 hard fought game that comes down to uh, a defensive stand in the last couple minutes to secure the victory. And uh, by the way, on Brunson's Bushini call, we can um, have a lot of storylines if he has a big game. Cause of course this was the site of the uh, punting incident of 2021. So we can have that in our back pocket ready to go. Bushini, Bushini flips the script on that one. One of the most amazing things I've ever seen in a press box is just knowing how <laughs> disastrous that was going 100%. to be before the ball even touched that guy's hands. How like, about rule referencing it this week? <laughs> you might as well get all the demons out now. Just, just get them all out. <laughs> one, of those, hide. one of those plays where you know that it's about to be broadcast on the TVs across Nebraska in the next 10 to 15 seconds off the delay and, and how people are about to lose their crap. You're thinking of that all as it's happening. Yeah, it's one of those where you know that you can just totally ruin it for someone, but you don't know what <laughs> you're supposed to say in that moment. In that moment at all. All right, Brunt, what do you got? Score prediction. Yeah, I, I'm similar to you guys. I think I've got Nebraska 23, Michigan State 15. That's what the card says. Uh, we'll go with that. Um, I, when you were talking about the punting thing, I wasn't sure if you were talking about the one a couple of years ago or where Michigan State continued to kick to De Mornay personnel. Like, why? Why? But well, anyway, Kirk Ferris didn't get that memo either. No, a lot of people didn't get that memo. Um, Nebraska 23, Michigan State 15. Um, ugly win, but uh, we don't call them ugly anymore. They're tough, tough wins, tough wins. <laughs> Inspired by Damon's 22, which I really spent some time figuring out how they would get to, uh, while everyone else was talking, I'm gonna go with 26 to 12. I don't know how, I don't know why, but weird scores are generally how Nebraska plays, and yeah. I think that they distance this game in the second half. I think that uh, Michigan State hangs around a little bit, but I I do think the Spartans are itching to quit on their season and Nebraska can kind of guide them there in the second half of the game. So I'm 26 to 12, four predictions for Nebraska this week, and then they are bowl eligible and we can start the great debate as to what Michael Brunts will pack to go to the pinstripe bowl on December 27th. I think. Hey, can I, can I, can I ask a quick question? If sure. Nebraska, if Nebraska gets to like, let's say seven and uh, you think the coaching staff would still clamor to like go to New York since everybody's there from the East Coast? Because I think right now they're like thinking, "Ooh, we get to go back to the East Coast." Like, will will they tell? Will they be telling some people no? What do you guys think? Because people will want Nebraska. Oh yeah, I think they'd be a very pot. Like if they finish eight and four, I think they would be. Oh, I don't popular... want to jump to eight. Yeah, yeah be all your homer network. <laughs> but I didn't right, say I... seven to start the season, so I'm sticking with it. Even they, at seven and five, I think the the Vegas Bowl is a very real possibility for them. If they win eight, they're not getting anywhere near New York. Like they're, <laughs> you're start talking, you're talking like Nashville. Yeah, or, yeah. Or, or maybe Arizona, talking, maybe a little Florida trip. I don't know. We'll see how the car how the fall, but. <laughs> Brunson's so cool. He doesn't even allow himself to get squirrely. He's like, I don't know, maybe even Florida. 
but it's still peppered. Some of the best birthdays of his life were spent down in Florida for Nebraska yeah. Bowl trips. I have I haven't been around my friends at Miller's Ale House in quite a while. Damon, if you're in Orlando we, and you need a place to watch some UFC, Miller's Ale House. Oh, Check it out there. Gotcha. Gotcha. Do we know I'm a big they UFC survived gotcha. the pandemic? Or do we know the Miller's Ale House still exists? Should I'll look this up. You guys talk amongst yourselves. I feel like they probably survived a lot of stuff. Like <laughs> the pandemic being the least of it. Oh, uh, it, it's getting it's getting a Google click. It is open. Yeah. International Inter- Boulevard, baby. International still there. Boulevard. Yep. Wow. Oh, I don't know. know. That looks on earth. This looks a little sketch. It's a huge trade on New Year's Eve, two years in a row. All right. Okay. I like the TV. I like the TV setup. So this isn't a, uh, it looks very, uh, corporate. Like, is this a, this isn't a chain, is it? I believe it is. I think it's a chain. It's a chain. Yeah. This looks, this looks like, uh, you know, Orlando's version of the old Fox and the Hound. If you've ever, if you've ever been there to watch a Brock Lesnar UFC fight, let me assure you, it is not corporate in the least. <laughs> Uh, Damon, I don't know if you've seen Forrest Gump, but uh, Brunt's looked like Lieutenant Dan on New Year's, where they just put a hat on him and everyone celebrating. I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big, I'm a big Forrest Gump guy. Yeah. Big Forrest Gump guy. That's what he looked like in in 2011 into 2012. Nobody better hurt my Jedi. <laughs> yeah, big Forrest guy. All I'm right. Uh, any anything else you want to add, Damon? Um, before we go here. No, nah, man. It's uh, you guys, you look the light in my day, man. I'm good. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, for Damon Benning, for Brian Christopherson, Michael Brunson, Mike Schaefer, this has been another Husker 24-7 podcast. Be sure to check out everything we have going on at Husker247.com.